really, um, I guess, defended. Uh, because for many countries, including our country, it's simply not true. Already, you just tell me when I stop. Okay, I've run out of time. You just pass to the next one. All good? Thank you. Yeah. Are you finished on both? I think so. We'll give the others a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. We should know, Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, you made uh, 12 minutes 31 seconds. <laughs> now we'll uh, move on to our second member of the panel, the Honourable Attorney General of Fiji and Minister of Economy, Honourable Sayed Kayum. 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, most of the ministers and indeed our, our friends from Australia will talk about the the same thing about you know resilience etc but i wanted to kind of um, hone it down into a couple of key issues uh, one of them is that uh, the the title is about blue um, economy but essentially we are looking at the overall uh, infrastructure the overall economy both blue and green i'm going to talk from the perspective of blue and green because generally now in the climate change speak if you mention blue economy or blue Blue, um, uh, the blue structures, you're talking only about oceanic measures. Um, now, so there are two aspects to climate change. One of them, of course, climate change is a very insidious nature. In other words, as the Minister for Cook Island said, that it can very slowly, it's been creeping up upon us. So you have salination of you know, agricultural lands, it's going into areas uh, where it should not be going, the ocean is, the weather patterns are changing, so when you plant your crops, etc. Um, those are the more insidious natures or, or nature of climate change. The other one is what we call the more immediate ones. In other words, the impact of climate change. You have the intensity of the storms, you have the frequency of the storms have you know, increased tremendously. So you, have a two, you need to have a two-pronged approach to finance in that respect. So if you, for example, have Cyclone Winston, Cyclone Pam, any other type of cyclone, from your financing perspective, you have two immediate issues. One is that you need to provide immediate finance to immediate relief measures. That's one thing. To get food to people, to get them access to uh, homes or shelter or tents, whatever the case may be. Then the next stage, of course, you need to get them access to utilities that may have gone away, been washed away, water, electricity. So that's one aspect of it. Now, the other aspect, of course, of climate change overall that we're talking about, as the economist from ADB had presented, was the long-term infrastructure requirements of the country and then building resilience into it. That's very critical. We need to draw a point of distinction between, between those two aspects of financing because sometimes when people actually calculate the requirement for financing, they put relief, immediate relief uh, funds together with the long-term capital investment that's required. So I think we need to separate that. We need to understand why the separation is, is very, very critical. Because you generally find that when, when you're talking about development partners, when you're talking about donors, they generally tend to come into the first space. You know, people come in, they bring tents. You have the Australian Navy coming in and, you know, providing relief supplies. Uh, the military will come in from other countries, etc. So, th thank you. So that's... That's more where you get the sort of sudden injection of funds and you require the sudden injection of funds. Now, the point from a domestic front is which countries or how can countries actually have some sort of buffer or fiscal space. Now, in Fiji, what we have been doing over the past few years, we provide, for example, five to ten million dollars in the budget to have a buffer. So, for example, if tomorrow there's a cyclone, we immediately have some funds that we can spend to buy food supplies to get the civil servants out to places where would not, they would not normally go because there's no cyclone. So that's the kind of funding you do require. PICRAFI that was mentioned earlier on by the minister, PICRAFI is more for immediate relief assistance. Now Fiji is not part of PICRAFI from a national perspective because we think that the premiums are too high and that the funds that were being allocated to PICRAFI was only about two to three million dollars, which we think that we can reallocate or readjust within our own budget mechanism. So I think the, the other point that I wanted to make, so if you're able to separate that, is in terms of building resilience, and I've highlighted this at the ADB meeting. Now Fiji, for example, uh, recognized this very much earlier on in the piece. So we had climate change to sit in foreign affairs. So very early, early on in the piece, we recognized that 
climate change actually needs to be mainstreamed. And what I mean by mainstream is needs to be mainstream in your national policy planning, into your development plans. This is why climate change is within the Ministry of Economy, which is a much broader perspective. So we're able to in, you know, infiltrate, if you like, for want of a better word, climate change discipline into the different ministries through the budgetary process. It is very interesting, uh, when we were in Washington a few weeks ago, uh, there is actually a, uh, a group, I forget, a group of ministers uh, that are ministers for finance who need to sign up to be more sensitive to climate change. It's called under the Helsinki principles. For Fiji, it was very organic to do that because already the Ministry of Economy has climate change in itself. So, Fiji, given the resilience, we actually asked the World Bank to carry out a uh, study for us. This is called the Climate Vulnerability Assessment, or CVA. Now, we recognize very long in the piece that in order to be able to know exactly what we need to spend to build resilience, we need to measure our vulnerability. And we, of course, we then can map out. We can also then go armed with this particular publication, go to our donors, go to our finances and say, look guys, this is what we need. This is where we will be spending the money, coupled with our national development plan. These are the specific targets that we do have. So this is very critical to do. So I think, you know, from a, from a governance perspective, you need to have a lot of transparency in your measurement of your vulnerability. And if you get third-party validation of that, that helps also. Now, Fiji has been deemed like Cook Islands, a middle-income country for a number of years. So Fiji was not the recipient, like Cook Islands, of the, what we call the IDA funds in the World Bank. In other words, concessional funding, we weren't entitled to that. So we've been kind of pushing the envelope for the past three or four years and saying to the World Bank that, look, we can have one climatic event that can wipe off decades of development. And in, in fact, that's what happened, obviously, with Winston. In fact, that those figures there need to be upgraded, uh, updated. In fact, the total cost of Winston was about $1.4 billion, you know, US dollars, one third of the value of our GDP within 24 hours. You can imagine that kind of catastrophic level. We were actually very, very lucky because Winston did not hit most of the tourism properties. If Winston had hit the tourism properties, we would have been in dire straits because the economy would not have been able to bounce back as quickly as it did. Of course, there were some fiscal measures we took, put in place. For example, the FNPF released funds and we had our bill, um, um, Help for Homes initiative that pumped in about $125 million into the economy that kind of churned it up and we have more economic growth very quickly. So we are able to now access IDA funds. But the point that the Minister for Cook Islands is making and alluded to was about the cost of funds. And I think that's the challenge for most Pacific Island countries, is to be able to access funds that are actually not as expensive as you would get in the open market. That's very, very tricky. Now, under the ADB study, they put six Pacific Island countries in what they call high distress debt levels. The economist is nodding his head. Six countries. Some of them are moderate. Some of them are sustainable. The reality is that it's not something necessarily only peculiar to the Pacific. It's also a problem that uh, uh, Caribbean countries face or landlocked countries in sub-Sahara Africa or other parts of Africa face because they've got enormous impact on the, on the economy because of climatic events and because of you know, other factors, but generally climatic events, that's putting a huge stress on the economic output of the country. Or they do have output, but then you have climatic events that actually push them back. So I think that is the challenge. And I think you know, one of the things we've been trying to do, of course, is we try to come up with creative measures to be able to source financing. I mean, I know a lot of people in Fiji have suddenly become experts in debt and talk about you know, the high levels of debt in Fiji, etc. But they don't actually know the real figures. Our debt to GDP ratio is about 45.9%. Um, but the reality of the matter is our debt exposure nominally is about $5.6 billion. So that's not a bad position to be in. So debt is not necessarily a bad thing as long as the debt is able to give you productive capacity. 
and you're able to build resilience at the same time. But it's not an easy choice. I'll give an example very quickly before I finish off. The Minister for Infrastructure is here. Now, if he's identified, for example, a particular stretch of the road where there are 10 villages, and we've said, okay, we want to get them connected to the electricity grid. Now, with X amount of dollars, he can connect the 10 villages. But if we say, let's build resilience, let's make sure that these electrical cables or poles don't blow down in the next cyclone. So what is the option? The option is to go underground. As we've done, if you look at the four-lane road coming out of Nandi Airport all the way to Martin Tar, etc., the cables are all underground. Now, but for the minister to be able to come and make those representations to the Ministry of Economy, if he wants to go down, it will be the, at the expense of seven of those villages not being connected. Why? Because the cost of going underground is almost three times as high or more than going above ground. So what does he do? Does he connect all ten villages now? Because the villages in the other seven, the, in the other seven villages will say, hang on guys, what about me? My kids want electricity. We want electricity now. I want refrigeration. When I catch the fish, I want to put it in the fridge. But he may turn around and say, well, hang on, no. I want to make sure that if I connect you to electricity, the poles don't blow down. These are what you call political economic choices. These are political economy issues. So, again, the point of the matter is, will our development partners, will the finances actually recognize that should the Minister of Infrastructure in conjunction with the Ministry of Economy make the decision to build resilience that we get some sort of reward? Should we be rewarded for the fact that we, instead of doing all 10 at one above ground might get blown down again tomorrow, are we, going, we are now going underground? Should we get access to concessional funding? Should we be able to partner with development partners? You see, because the reality of the matter is that if you talk about adaptation versus mitigation, most of the Pacific Island countries actually need funds for adaptation. As Minister for the Deputy Prime Minister from Cook Islands has highlighted, our carbon footprint is almost negligible in the overall scheme of things. Yet we are the coal face of climate change. So we have to bear the cost. So what, what are the issues? How do we deal with these matters? So these are not necessarily, you know, uh, very easy solutions. The cost of those funds are very, very important. Uh, the ability to en ensure that uh, it's less stressful on your balance sheets is also critically important. Australia, as we've heard, has also provided some uh, funding, $2 billion, $1.5 billion in, in funding, and hopefully very concessional funding, and also then $500 million uh, by way of grant. So I'll, I'll just finish off very quickly I assume my 10 minutes is up. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop. We can have some One more minute, Honorable Minister, if you want. Sorry? One more minute for you, Okay. Sir. I just wanted to highlight one particular issue. Like Nandi River, we've been talking a lot about the Nandi River. Nandi is the gateway to Fiji. The international airport is there. Most of our tourism arrivals, most of you leave Fiji for holiday, etc., go away, come through Nandi. Nandi River floods all the time. There was a JICA mission back in the 1990s that wanted to actually, uh, you know, have a completely realignment of Nandi River. Those of you Nandi know Nandi well, the back road, to put it straight out all the way through where Colonial Plaza is in that area. Of course, it never happened, the money disappeared and what have you, we don't know about that. But now, we have been working for the past two years with JICA and the Japanese government, and they're very good partners, but we spend a lot of money of ourselves to actually come up with a very good study, hydrology, your uh, geotech studies and what have you. As a result of that, we now have about five development partners that are keen to fund it. So you have the Japanese government, JICA, we have uh, the ADB, we have now the uh, European Investment Bank, we now have the Australians, and of course we now have for the first time the French uh, Development Bank, which only funds in the French territories, have decided to come to Fiji for this particular project. It's a $400 million project. It's a $400 million project. Now, the, the three different stages to it. But that money needs to be spent, otherwise you have to relocate Nandi Town if, for the long term. So these are the kind of projects that we are looking at. Obviously, they are much smaller projects. Last point I want to make is relocation. 
Fiji is going to set up a, what we call a relocation, uh, a climate change relocation trust fund. There are 43 villages have been identified. We've already moved three villages to higher ground that needs to be moved to higher ground. We have what we call a, and Fiji did this earlier on, a planned relocation guideline that actually addresses things like gender issues also. If you're going to move a village that's been living there for the past 150, 200 years to a higher ground, it's a complete dislocation. The cultural practices, the sources of livelihood that they had is all going to change now. So we need to be able to fund this. So Fiji is going to set up a separate trust fund to be able to attract overseas donors or partners that can help us with the relocation whilst we provide a seed funding. We have what we call the uh, environment climate adaptation levy. Those of you, if you're going to stay at a hotel that makes more than $1.5 million, if you can drink beer at a pub that makes more than $1.5 million, rent a car from the company rent that makes more than $1.5 million, or watch a movie, uh, then you pay actually 10%. Now from the 10% of those funds, those funds by law actually have to be spent only on environmental and climate adaptation measures. And you can see this publication is available on the website too. So we're going to take about 10% of that every year and put it in the relocation trust fund so we can continuously fund these projects and relocate people to higher ground. So these are, you know, not very easy issues, but the, from a finance perspective, the point I just wanted to make is that sourcing finance that is, has attractive rates and be able to work with the private sector is something that is a huge challenge to all of us, and this is something that we need to work on. Of course, I can go about insurance, but I'll let the Minister for Samoa speak. Thank you. Navale, Honorable Attorney General. And now we welcome Honorable Tuyoti, the Finance Minister of Samoa.